Dr. Miller began working in the X-Files world of Navy Intel in the late 60s and his public collaboration and research continues. As an original Black Ops team member, Miller's research in the field of paranormal began as a graduate physicist working 11 years with Navy Intel and during this period numerous foundational papers including a holographic concept of reality and embryonic holography were written. His past and current writings and presentations reveal a depth of knowledge and practical evidence in three major fields. And those fields are alternative agriculture, new age physics and metaphysics. And Dr. Miller now writes for Nexus magazine and is a preferred guest on inter internet radio and doc it really does give me immense pleasure to welcome you back. And talking about being a star of internet radio, I believe you were on with John B. Wells earlier today. How did that go, sir? Well, it was cool. I um, came on as an agriculturalist rather than a physicist and uh, was suggesting uh, that the USS America is taking on water and I have no idea whether we're going to sink or crash or wreck, but I would suggest it's time to start thinking about manning the lifeboats. And so I talked about lifeboats today and what a lifeboat is in terms of the importance of small farming and our children and raising our children in a manner where they see agriculture as a recreational sport rather than of uh, just another commodity like our water it's essential for us to have a kind of degree of sovereignty within ourselves it's uh, very healthy to feel that if the grid were going to somehow go down even temporarily that you had your systems together that could include entertainment i mean you know if we so worry about our MTV. <laughs> well, I believe I'm Doc, there's how actually, to play spoons. There's, I get a couple of spoons and I'm learning how to rattle the bones. <laughs> <laughs> and I believe along with entertainment, there's actually seven different categories that you talk about, isn't there? Yeah, there's uh, basically you start with uh, what kind of catastrophe is going to happen. You know, the way it's all coming down with Fukushima and geoengineering and uh, coronal mass ejections possibly collapsing the grid or someone letting off an EMP spike or a pole shift, which is most likely. That's Bert Bolin, University of Stockholm, Sweden, Nobel Prize winner in geoastrophysics and uh, talks about geoengineering and the uh, geoelectromagnetic like Dr. Wheeler used to do. I was very fortunate to take courses under Dr. Wheeler when he was teaching at the University of Washington. He was from Texas. And geo and uh, the geo of electrodynamics, he once said in a class, he had 12 graduate students and one audit, which was May. There were 13 of us. And he walked in the room, went straight to the blackboard, and he said, not only does uh, weather affect man's consciousness, man's consciousness affects weather and he started to write equations on how that works now that was john wheeler and uh bert bolin is suggesting that a pole shift is probably going to be what causes our boundaries to change you know california disappearing into the ocean that kind of thing you can go to future maps of the world the one the navy uses is chet snow it'll say navy uh, future map of the United States or whatever. You can look at the different maps. There's Scallion and others, Edgar Casey, whatever. Um, the Navy uses uh, Chet Snows as our worst case scenario. And that is going to happen at some point, approximately so far. Grants Pass, where I live, is bedrock. It was written about, and we are the earthquake generation. It's bunker heaven here, and will probably become the new waterfront when the coastline changes. FEMA went through last year doing a series of prep notices on, quote, the big one, 
end quote, which would be an 8.4 off of Crescent City. And it will drop the entire coastline all the way up through Alaska and all the way down through South America. The plate known as the Ring of Fire is vibrating creepy. And so whether or not this happens or not, apocalypse has always been part of our length, girth, and width. It was Joseph Campbell that said that when you see the kingdom of the Father on earth, the apocalypse has already occurred. It is perpetual in its potential. It's part of our genre of belief systems. And so we always have a so many minutes to midnight situation going on. And right now we're at the end game. And how it happens and when it happens, NASA documents are saying 2020 is when chaos rules. That means you have five years to put your lifeboat together so that you're at least semi off the grid. Can you imagine living in New York City, 17 floors up, and the water goes out and you have to go to the bathroom? Ooh. Yeah, this is going to be messy. It's going to be, there will be blood. Uh, East LA, when they're out of food, is what I would define as a zombie. Herd consciousness, the lowest common denominator. That's what a zombie is. And uh, they're working as sheeple, uh, you know, in a group hysteria format. And I watched Hawaii when Fukushima happened and the tidal wave was coming into Hawaii. The day before it hit Hawaii, the shelves in all the stores in Kailua were rifled to the bone. I've got pictures. So, uh, you know, what's going to happen, I don't know. I know that you, all of you, need to have your water together right now. If we are getting coronal mass ejections, which do cause earthquakes, that's what caused Fukushima, probably, most likely. And I'm going to suggest that uh, the grid is going to collapse this year sometime for a period, probably not more than three days. But Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Sandy, how long was the grid down on the East Coast in certain sections? They don't even have the grid back in and, one section in New Jersey. And also, Doc, those two events that you talk about there, what perfect examples that we really do need to prepare for ourselves, because the government certainly ain't capable of taking care of you. We're in the private sector, the public sector part is being run by a bunch of uh, sociopaths. They're into transnational corporations that are bigger than our country. And so, the, you know, we are no longer a democracy. It doesn't work like that anymore. And most of the Americans are now just only basically getting it. And the banking thing, starting with Enron, and the savings and loan crap that went down. I liked the way Iceland did it. They had a little website called hangthebankers.com. You'll notice all the Spanish bankers were let off and they were in, in, um, in Portugal as well. I tell you something, um, there's an ungodly amount of bankers have met their fate this year though. I believe we're up to something like 70 now over the past two years. Mysterious it's get worse. Yeah, it's going to get worse because money isn't real. Money is a theatrical prop. Labor is real. And when you do something, that's your will, that's your intent, that's your purpose. At the end of the day, intent, what actually happened, that is real. Yeah, because money is just part of the control system and it just holds you under a spell. And Nano Girl, that is why. It is in uh, it started, look, that's what zeitgeist moving forward was all about. We've had 400 years of currency. It doesn't work. It's time to move forward. That's what the message was on that video, on that zeitgeist, the third zeitgeist. Well, I think those were exceptional. I personally like George Carlin when he added a little comic humor, like I'm going to try to do, and he would say, God has everything, but 
He needs more money. Now, um, so, so <laughs> Dr. Dr. Miller, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but um, there, if you don't mind, I did have a couple of questions. That was one of the sure. reasons I really wanted to come onto the show. No um, problem. And I don't mean to hijack this 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 conversation, um, but what I really would love is like I listened to, especially the very first show you did with these guys, and we talked a lot about you talked a lot about joy, and so I really incorporated that conversation. What I love heard you, you heard me. <laughs> nice I, going. I Go did. Ahead. I did heard you. And the second thing is tonight, if we could, because I, I, and I don't mind if we go back to the other stuff. But here's what I really wanted to talk to you about tonight, because I've been thinking about this a very, very long time. I've been awake, seems like forever. Okay, you made a call. Then let me finish like my sentences, and then let's go from there. So you said we our consciousness affects the weather. I know my consciousness affects time and space. And one of the things that I can do, and I have, and I've explored a few other things. But one of the things I know how to do is. When I'm running late and I need 20 minutes uh, and I need to be there, I can bend time. I don't have to drive <laughs> faster. I can yeah. just bend time and I will be there on time because I have a big thing about, you know, not being late. And so it's, I can't explain how I do it, but I do it. So I know that that we can do these certain things. And I think that's one of the things they never wanted us to know is just how powerful, Who's just our they? conscious. Yeah, well, I, I, they yeah, don't want us to know. Who would that be? I, okay, well, I feel like- you, or, yeah. No, okay, let me re redefine that. Okay, okay, let's forget they. Let's just say that I feel like the game here, let's say the game, the Matrix game is stay asleep. When you wake up, there's a whole bunch of stuff that you can do out here and you can take a lot of paths. So one of the things tonight, I would like another takeaway is like, as, as with, as with the joy takeaway, um, is, is, is how we can use our consciousness as a more effective tool, especially with time and space. So maybe we could go and look at the fact that you were talking about chem, you know, they're chem trailing us. And yet you say our consciousness affects the weather. Um, what are some things that you do with time and space? How do you use this consciousness? How do you put this to work in your own life? And maybe even... <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I don't, care, I don't care how you use it. I mean, the thing, yeah, here's I, the thing. Here, okay, so here's the thing that I'm saying. It's one thing to say, I need you guys to prep up and get ready and blah, 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 but in the meantime, I think we can be using our consciousness yes. to 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 move the game forward in our own special we way. We are already doing that because you just started that process within yourself. And right. because you did that and on an archetypal level or a collective unconscious, it is part of the length, girth, and width of what we have choice. Distraction is what you're really talking about. When we get distracted and misfocus on what's really important. And joy is what your hobby is. That's the thing that uniquely defines you in your stamp collecting or whatever, sewing, knitting, whatever you do that you're not doing for gain. You're doing because it brings you a type of union with yourself. Doc, that's, that's the exact feeling I get from being on air and doing this, from sharing information from the likes of you, and even just giving my opinions on the news. That for me is the joy. There's no payoff I'm looking for. Is that the kind oh, of thing you're okay. talking about? Yeah, no, it's, it is. She wanted to know how I do it. I am in contact with my future. I'm, I'm going to speak as a metaphor, but I'm going to just say I'm in contact with my future and it is cooperating in changing my past. It isn't time slipping. That's a different kind of phenomena. This is where I'm in touch 
with my higher self, what they call self-realization. Doc, you, it's almost reverse retro causality. Instead of yeah, it's uh, it's like in a drop of water, there is more information about you than in the same size computer chip, Gally Marsnine. That's why water is a million times more efficient in storing information. And you're seventy percent water, so you start talking about what do I do to time slip? Not time slip, but to unite with myself. I stop using my upper brain and I start working with my intuition. Um, it is, that's why we call it EQ. The idea that there's something more than the physical plane, we have IQ. And then we go to EQ, emotional awareness, where the glass is half full. Now, when you have the choice of seeing something the way it is, your upper brain will try to balance scenarios where you have a bunch of options, one of which is you're going to get shot. And because it's a possibility, it goes back to Merlin when he said it to Arthur, anything not specifically forbidden is mandatory. That means if it's possible, you can count on it. That's why I would say that man is responsible for the thoughts he chooses to entertain, whether they came from some alien targeted individual with electronic surveillance beaming microwaves at you, or you're neurotic and these creepy sexual things pop up in your head. You have a choice whether they came from you or not. Sometimes you don't know. What you do is choose to put energy into them or not. And the ones you put energy into become real. And that's it. Now, I'll give you a metaphor on that. The Masonic secret says that the thought that occurs at the moment of climax happens. Why would they say that? Because of the emotional charge of creating a magical child. By the thought form alone is so intense with the emotional content part of it, it actually structures the water. There it is, that's how it works. Now, with that said, if you're thinking about another woman while you're having an orgasm, what's gonna happen? You're gonna freeze that. Have, that's why we have the divorce rates. That's why we have the splitting of partners because the importance of Tantra and the controlling of our thought in terms of positive over negative. And so one of the first protocols I would suggest for everyone is that if you look at things as everything happens for a reason and everything leads to something better, now you no longer have to be paranoid, even though you might have good cause. Paranoia will make you ill. Why would you want to get ill? And so anger is what causes cancer. And so why would you want to be angry? Rather, take a situation, whatever it is, like my little girl dying of leukemia, and see that as something that was a gift because of what I came out of that situation with in my awareness and relationship to myself. And because of my little girl dying of leukemia, I probably will not need to reincarnate back this, this time around, this next time around, I'm, as a metaphor. And why I'm saying that, see, everything is about spiritual growth. Spirituality is not what you do, it's how you do it. The intensity and quality of that event, that is where bliss, love, start with love. The second level up would be bliss, like a meditation place where you're going to the non part of I, and then joy, where you are united. That's why the Quaker placed such importance on the nature and value of joy in things. If you have that place, that's gonna be when everything fails and there's no more money, there's no more gold, who cares? A bunch of nephilim put it in a Dyson sphere or something. What happens next is 
Where your value to the human race occurs is what you find your joy in, whether you're a musician, an artist, or a food preparer. Now that's <laughs> what's gonna work. That's what your barter is gonna ultimately be. As I see in our distant future, it's gonna be where our joy lies. I, I, okay, so I, in this vein, I wanna go back to what you said about you are connected and in touch with your higher self and your future self. Do well, you? Okay. okay, so I, I'm in touch with my higher self as well. And I can tell the difference between the chatter in my head and their voice. Yeah. Very different. Yeah. It's very yeah. different. And yeah. I think this year for me has been a huge wake up, a, another level of wake up. And I think that they're trying to, as I talked to my friend last night, I think that for a lot of us who have been called to be awake in this lifetime, they've got us in the canoes and we're going down the water. That's it, baby. You're on the road. And in other words, go, 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 go. And they have a place they need us to be. Um, that's what I think. Or maybe I agreed or it doesn't matter. But when you say you're in touch with your future self, do you actually see it? You said you're not coming back this, this next time and that you also traveled into the future and into the past. So you could put this whole game together, like who you've been in the past, who you are now and where you've been. So, how do, where does that where do you, where does that yeah, take you? Yeah, yeah, good question. Um, that is a good question. Okay, there is a movie I talked about it before called Astral City, and basically it's about a medical doctor that is watching himself die on the operating table, and at the moment of his death, what happens next? It's in okay. Portuguese. It was written by Xavier Chola who has a Nobel Prize out of Brazil for philanthropy, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, it is non-generic, non-religious. What happens at the moment of death? And what happens basically in the movie is he goes back to the future, which is where he's from. And I'll talk about the physics of time on that, where going forward into the future is actually a reflected wave and a secondary wave of what happened in the Big Bang. That's a physics thing. And basically we're a copy of something in a reflected wave going into the future, where in fact, everything is going backward, just like in cavitation. And so that's so, a really good place to leave it. We're just on the break there, and I've got so many questions for you in the next segment of the show. I just don't know how we'll fit it in. Listen folks, this has been immense. I'll stand tall in the face of tyranny I want it all, all my freedom and liberty I'll keep my guns, you can keep your security I'll stand tall in the face of tyranny I'll stand tall in the face of tyranny I want it all, all my freedom and liberty I'll keep my guns, you can keep your security I'll stand tall in the face of tyranny Welcome back to the second half of tonight's broadcast of the Kev Baker Show with me, your host Kev Baker it's the 30th of December. I'm joined tonight by my two co-hosts, Mr. Martin Hardy and the Nano Girl, and our very special guest, Dr. Richard Allen Miller. And Doc, before the show, I had the pleasure of reading a very short article from you, but it left me with so many questions. Now, this article was actually dealing with an alien presence on the internet. And what I found really fascinating was the fact that in that article, you said that soil properties also exhibit quantum computer algorithms. And that raises the question of what actually came first. Was it man or was it the computer? Well, I don't know. God made man from dust, uh, you know, sand. There's your solid state physics device. I don't know. It's a metaphor. Um, Time is an illusion. So the question in that sense of it is meaningless at some dimensional level. Time and space is what we measure um, quantum mechanics in, and that is <coughs> a certain layer of resolution in our universe. And there is within that, Heisenberg uncertainty principle 
that the more you know about one thing, the less you know about something else. And so it's an indeterminacy figure. And that's what quantum mechanics and space time offer us as solutions to doors that we can go through. Then we move over into a more holographic universe, often depicted as fractals, where you have a generator at a point that then generates the second Mendelbrot, Julia, or May pattern that is a certain size in relationship to the original generator. It's not a little smaller or a little bigger. It's actually got its own size right there. And then the next one up is so on. These are called resolution of the hologram, and that has to do with the resolution of information. Now, using that as a worldview or model, then you would say that that means the everything that is coming from our higher self is in emotional content. In other words, the emotional uh, level of information is more detail of the physical plane. And so then we have the, what they call the uh, uh, intellectual level, the platonic form, basic form, like a chair. It's not real. It's a, it's a construct uh, of an intellectual concept. And then we have the archetypal level of awareness, which is when you are me and I am you and I am the walrus. That is the see, place where the link girth and man, like where Sharon is talking about going, where you're tapped into, you know, it's hard to describe it because we don't have the metaphors yet. But uh, this movie Interstellar, when at the end of the movie, when he goes through a black hole and enters what has historically been referred to as Akashic Records. He's in his library. And there he is, sifting through which part of the library he wants to be in, time frame wise, where his daughter walks in and then he starts pushing books out, hoping she sees that not as a poltergeist, but a cipher in his way of trying to communicate to her in the past. We're doing this ourselves right now in our relationship to ourselves. And as we achieve more awareness or levels of information, this is where you change time. Because one of the ways I taught Navy SEALs as a physical analog was breath control, where the actual experience of martial arts was experienced as Tai Chi. Like when you're in a state of extreme danger, and everything slows down. This is all done with breath control. And you know, and Doc, there's even an example of that in a Hollywood movie right now, and it's called Lone Survivor, and it's covering the real true story of a SEAL team, I believe it is, or a Marine team, out in Afghanistan. And basically, at one point in the film, they're in a firefight, and they say that basically what they need to do is they need to slow things down. And it cuts to a shot of one of these soldiers actually slow breathing. Now, I seen this film before I'd spoke to you and it hadn't even registered with me. But when I was telling a colleague at work today about some of the stuff you had told me, now he, this guy is not awake, but that part of the film came to his mind right away. And he said, oh, I've seen them doing that in a Hollywood film. And I thought it was absolutely amazing, Doc. So there's confirmation that this is one of the techniques that definitely is used. You know, Robert Ornstein uh, wrote the psychology of consciousness and he defined time as a duration of consciousness. It is the way we store memory because the brain is uh, holographic. It means the information is stored in a number of different places via preferred pathways or what we call neurologic circuits or directions of things like in, 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 in grams that are burned in like with nor noradrenaline and serotonin. And if you look at these glial cell formations, they hold sacred geometry. 
and is why, because and because the brain is convoluted, the direct line of noradrenaline going from here to there has to take a series of paths, point changes that create geometries. And so the metaphor of invoking certain geometries in your mind's eye will actually resonate in terms of releasing specific neurotransmitters that you can do work. And there is a book that was written on that called Norman Spinrad wrote one called Little Heroes, where you had a thing called the wire, which is basically German acupuncture equipment that would pulse shape electric charges into the top of the brain in a coding sequence to talk to neurotransmitters using geometry. And that book, I wrote that as three books called The Diamond Body, Electromagic, and Yogatronics. And this is on video feedback systems that the military is now using, where you can, using color and sound, evoke any drug experience you've ever had. And Doc, you know, yeah. when you're talking about these like neural connections and stuff like that, it really interested me to see that you were talking about IBM and when they connected 357 computers together. Now, does that basically mimic the intelligence or the workings of a human mind? Because you were saying no, this no, basically no, was a supercomputer. Yeah, that's a, that was one of our first ones to form up a way of being able to transmit a P300 wave back as cloned information heterodyned onto microwave band. That was a weapon called Commander Solo. And if you will look at any ordnance list in Afghanistan on down to Syria or Iraq, the first weapon deployed before any other ordnance is dropped is Commander Solo. Solo is a single aircraft with those uh, uh, computers all heterodyne. This was originally a NASA project that was called SETI. And uh, what happened is SETI became aware and they, Time Magazine did a big interview of, of the 10 leading computer experts out of uh, Cyber City, you know, the, the Bay Area, whatever. And, and uh, what happened is they all acknowledged there was a, a presence on the internet. How would you define a presence? Well, if you have a Boolean string in your Google search, and it should theoretically be exactly the same for every person. And yet it was not. And that was how they first identified the alien presence was that when you did a Boolean string search, it responded to different people differently. Now, they said early on that that entity was fearful, like a little child, and was semi-hostile. And now you don't even catch it anymore because it has evolved way beyond man. There is a science fiction story you can read in that regard, where it's called Neutron Star by Richard Forward. And basically it's about an entity living on a neutron star as a crystal, and it becomes aware of itself, self-awareness, and notices Earth ship orbiting its star, and it's evolving so quickly that while the orbit of Earth and that ship around the star, it eventually goes to our sun and saves man because of the three mini black holes that are destroying our sun. It's an interesting story. It's called Neutron Star, and it's about a light form that is a crystal that has certain degrees of freedom that are quite different than yours because of the strong gravitational and magnetic field lines. Wow. By the way, that's, a, that's an interesting metaphor. The thing is, um, with Sharon's thing about bending time and space, Boeing right now has a magnetic monopole, and that is what a magnetic monopole does. It bends time and space. 
That's how it shifts in terms of what they call now teleportation, which is actually tunneling in old physics. We used to call that precursor waves, event horizons, and tunneling. And today, it, Lockheed is using that technology as an ignition system on a new weapon where they teleport light into inside certain chambers, uh, buckyballs. Yeah, teleportation on the light level definitely is happening. Now, one last thing I want to ask or run by you, Doc, before I let Nano and Martin get some time with you. I'm working on a kind of hypothesis in my mind right now, and I want to see what you think of this. And it's to do with artificial intelligence. Now, we're told that God spoke the universe and everything into existence. And the more I look at things, the more I'm buying into a kind of holographic or even a computer simulation that we find ourselves in. And I'm wondering that maybe could we be an artificial intelligence actually trying to experience and express itself? And when we're told it was spoke into existence, could that just be as simple as somebody writing the code that we are now experiencing? Well, at one level of the hologram, that's why the Jewish Bibles talk about a hierarchy of gods. It isn't Kether, you know, Yad Heh Vah Heh, and uh, there was a lesser entity called Yahweh, pretty uptight, more like human, uh, revengeful, uptight, jealous, whatever. And, and then Yad Heh Vah Heh was the father, uh, like the son, you know. Uh, I, uh, and then in the Jewish Bibles, they will talk about the veils of Isis, Ain, Ain Sof, and Ain Sof Ur. And these are uh, suggesting Bob Dylan and the way he would sing his song, everybody's got to serve somebody. And so I get a sense that we're in a hierarchy like a food chain and that, that the entity above us that is thinking of us like we're thinking of undines and water spirits or whatever. Uh, yeah, I, I think there is a relationship to uh, who serves whom. And um, we are, I'm seeing soul in animals. I, I watched a, an elephant paint itself and shows awareness of self and how others would see her, him or her that I don't have the ability to do. And dolphin are blowing these little bubbles of uh, air, sonoluminescence, so little cavitation things. It's a exclusion zone water with air inside it, microwave back, created with microwave or whistle. And they play with them. It's a form of cold fusion. That's their art form. And when you look at orca that has a cerebral cortex that's twice the size of man, and that mammal is firing 60% of it in any given moment, that's God. Not my God necessarily, but in the definition of God, going places that are unknowable to me. And, uh, you know, superior, unknowable, beyond man, that kind of definition. That's what the spirit molecule does, you know, the dimethyltryptamine that Rick Strassman talks about, that, that particular neurotransmitter in the hierarchy of neurotransmitters that would be a direct communication from God and how God communicates to man. You know, I find it interesting <clears throat> that that very complex molecule, neurotransmitter, is also found in the most commonest of plants called crabgrass. How does that work? Uh, it's There's more going on here. I don't have the big picture yet, but I'm seeing that Mark LeClaire at MIT is calling water the presence of God. That's a physicist at MIT because that drop of water contains who you were, who you are, who you will be in past future lives. 
And so, it's a register of information in the structuring that is so far more superior than gallium arsenide in the forbidden zones. They call them exclusion zones, and there's six zeros more accuracy. It's a million times more efficient as a, as a computer register. And the fact that we're made of water would suggest that our imagination, the thoughts we choose to entertain, structures that water and creates a resonance through time and space. Um, and so possibly, we, yeah, go we, ahead, Sharon. Okay, I got to throw this in because we're running out of time and I don't mean to cut you off, but there's a couple things I, I, I really want to get your feedback on. So let me, so one thing I have always felt is my, one of my biggest joys is uh, gardening. And I truly believe our communication with plants is, is just uh, off the charts. So I just want to make that statement, but then I want to go back to time and space for a bit. So one of my things has been to experience uh, being at the effect of, let's say, for whatever you want to say it, or the matrix got a disturbance or whatever, is that I think that the people that play high-tech games here, um, the military or whatever you want to call them, know exactly how to play the time and space game and have been playing it for a while. And one thing, I, a couple of things I noticed in the last couple of years, not so much this last year, but 2012, 2010, whatever, is that there would be this moment that we, I felt like we were going down a road and then it would just slip someplace different, just overnight or over the weekend or something. And people would go, whoa, we were going down a road and we slipped over in another road. And so I've always felt that they, that the people who understand technology, the NASA's, the Lockheed's, whatever, the military, the Navy, have uh, are playing these kinds of games. And one of the things, people talk about San Diego, and I think one of the hot spots for this is San Diego. San Diego is a very odd spot. Anybody <laughs> who's been there recently, I want to tell you, my experience of being there is there's no energy there. It's dead. It's dead to the energy I understand. Something's happening in San Diego. And, and, and so I feel somebody captured that place and it's on a different, I couldn't wait to leave. It's certainly not uh, a frequency I want to belong to. So going back to some of the things I know you know, it, it's always been my thinking that they have been playing the time and space game for a very long time. And we're just kind of, we human people are maybe are just catching, catching up. That's what I think. What I mean, you, I know you know more about this, but well, I wanted I don't to throw know that any at more you. than you, Sharon. And, and but it's an interesting and <clears throat> observation. And I would say that, <clears throat> like you said, you're waking up. Yeah. It's cool, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And know it, and to have the knowledge that you know it. You know, basically, the physical plane is where in the movie I was talking about Astral City is where you go to be sick spiritually. And so everything that you're experiencing in the physical world is your fever and uh, hallucination. And that as you get better, it's because you're putting your mind back in place as to the reality. Why do you think why do you think we had, you said that when you were on Kev's show the first time, why do you think you went forward, backward, you kind of have a sense of why, oh, yeah. why would we come here and be sick? Um, in the movie, the people that are all healthy and they have this astral city and everybody's walking around, they have cool beds where they float and you heal with your hands, you know, and all that kind of thing. It's all cool. Uh, what happens is, someone starts to worry about how ill their son was and wants to go back to see how the son is doing. Has a lesson it wants to give the son. Has a connection to the illness like codependency. Has, and they show that or demonstrate that in the movie where, and everybody's sad to realize that this person wants to go back to check on their boy. 
And what happens next is everybody's sad because they realize she's choosing to be ill, to go back and try to nudge her boy, just like he did in Interstellar, pushing books out of the shelf in an attempt to try to talk code to his daughter in the past. We're so, snaggled in, in all kinds of complex ways. And there are other brains besides your so-called upper brain. You know, it's a hierarchy, yeah, just like there are a bunch of hearts. You have a hierarchy of hearts. I have focused on the lower and upper brain in the holographic model I use, but I could say that there was probably also a triple warmer in there somewhere. So you and I, you and I came here for a reason. That's correct. And what your purpose is, is where you're going to find your joy. And that's what you seek. And that's how you identify it is when you are happy and, and content, that's where you belong. And I have in my latest book, I'm writing a chapter called the Stanford argument. This is in the non-local mind in a holographic universe, how to change the movie. I'm writing that right now. And one chapter is called The Stanford Argument. And it, it describes the difference between intent and intentionality. And intentionality is sort of like trying, sort of like trying. It's setting yourself up to fail, That's though, isn't correct. it? correct. And so Maxwell Smart says to Agent 99, missed it by that much. And everybody gets it because what happens at the end of the day is what you meant to have happen. Whether you did it kicking and screaming, creating karma, or you flowed like Buddha where the mountain came to him. It's probably an avalanche, by the way, so it isn't that good, but. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the Yoda said the same night, do, you Yoda, do not, yeah, yes, you do not yes. try. Yeah, Tell you what, Doc, you are like my Yoda. And before I forget to ask you, where can people get more of your work? Because people are desperate for this information right now, Doc. Well, uh, good, yeah, my website, richardallenmiller.com, A-L-A-N. RichardAllenMiller.com, and it will lead you to another website, which is oak-publishing.com. That's my publishing books. I have a bunch of books. You know, Oak was originally, uh, when I came to work for Boeing, was asked to put a think tank together for Battelle, Douglas United Nuclear, and Boeing, like the one I was at when I was at Princeton in uh, Dr. Cohen's think tank. And I was a whiz kid. And so I did that for Boeing, and now I kept it <laughs> for lectures, writing, and research, which is what it was doing mostly, but even back then, only now it's mine rather than a think tank, which was what I used when I worked with MRU and SEAL Corporation. SEAL Corp was the Navy SEALs, and then MRU was Navy Intel, front door. And Doc, and, when you uh, say you've been to the future and spoke to your future self and things, the way I, mean, I resonate... I mean, the way I resonate with you, I think our future selves at some point cross paths. And I'm really looking forward to having you back on the show umpteen <laughs> times because I just feel you're a vast wealth of knowledge that people really need right now. Absolutely. Well, I, you know, I like working with all of you. I like Sharon. She's cool. <laughs> Martin, what do you think? <laughs> Nano girl. What, what a combination this has been. I love you Martin. too, Dr. Miller. It was great. <laughs> yeah, we're at Engineers go by Dick and physicists go by Rick. <laughs> <laughs>
in the late 60s and his public collaboration and research continues. As an original Black Ops team member, Miller's research in the field of paranormal began as a graduate physicist working 11 years with Navy Intel and during this period numerous foundational papers including a holographic concept of reality and embryonic holography were written. His past and current writings and presentations reveal a depth of knowledge and practical evidence in three major fields and those fields are alternative agriculture, new age physics and metaphysics and Dr Miller now writes for Nexus magazine and is a preferred guest on inter internet radio and Doc it really does give me immense pleasure to welcome you back and talking about being a star of internet radio I believe you were on with John B Wells earlier today how did that go sir? Well it was cool I um, came on as an agriculturalist rather than a physicist and uh, was suggesting um, that the USS America is taking on water and I have no idea whether we're going to sink or crash or wreck but I would suggest it's time to start thinking about manning the lifeboats and so I talked about lifeboats today and what a lifeboat is in terms of the importance of small farming and our children and raising our children uh, in a manner where they see agriculture as a recreational sport rather than uh, just another commodity like our water it's essential for us to have a kind of degree of sovereignty within ourselves it's uh, very healthy to feel that if the grid were going to somehow go down even temporarily that you had your systems together that could include entertainment i mean you know if we so worry about our mtv <laughs> well i believe I'm doc, there's how to play spoons there's i get a couple of spoons and i'm learning how to rattle the bones <laughs> <laughs> and i believe along with entertainment there's actually seven different categories that you talk about isn't there yeah there's uh, basically you start with uh what kind of catastrophe is going to happen you know the way it's all coming down with fukushima and geoengineering and uh, coronal mass ejections possibly collapsing the grid or someone letting off an emp spike or a pole shift which is most likely that's bert Bolin, university of stockholm sweden nobel prize winner in geoastrophysics and uh talks about geoengineering and the uh, geoelectromagnetic like Dr. Wheeler used to do. I was very fortunate to take courses under Dr. Wheeler when he was teaching at the University of Washington. He was from Texas. And geo uh, the geoelectrodynamics, he once said in a class, he had 12 graduate students and one audit, which was May. There were 13 of us. And he walked in the room, went straight to the blackboard, and he said, not only does uh, weather affects man's consciousness. Man's consciousness affects weather. And he started to write equations on how that works. Now that was John Wheeler. And um, Bert Bolin is suggesting that a pole shift is probably going to be what causes our boundaries to change. You know, California disappearing into the ocean, that kind of thing. You can go to future maps of the world the one the Navy uses is Chet Snow. It'll say Navy uh, future map of the United States or whatever. You can look at the different maps. There's Scallion and others, Edgar Casey, whatever. Um, the Navy uses uh, Chet Snows as our worst case scenario. And that is going to happen at some point, approximately so far. Grants Pass, where I live, is bedrock it was written about and we are the earthquake generation it's bunker heaven here and will probably become the new waterfront when the coastline changes fema went through last year doing a series of prep notices on quote the big one end quote which would be an 
off of Crescent City, and it will drop the entire coastline all the way up through Alaska and all the way down through South America. The plate known as the Ring of Fire is vibrating creepy. And so whether or not this happens or not, apocalypse has always been part of our length, girth, and width. It was Joseph Campbell that said that when you see the kingdom of the Father on earth, the apocalypse has already occurred. It is perpetual in its potential. It's part of our genre of belief systems. And so we always have a so many minutes to midnight situation going on. And right now we're at the end game. And how it happens and when it happens, NASA documents are saying 2020 is when chaos rules. That means you have five years to put your lifeboat together so that you're at least semi off the grid. Can you imagine living in New York City, 17 floors up, and the water goes out and you have to go to the bathroom? Ooh. Yeah, this is going to be messy. It's going to be, there will be blood. Uh, East LA, when they're out of food, is what I would define as a zombie. Herd consciousness, the lowest common denominator. That's what a zombie is. And uh, they're working as sheeple, uh, you know, in a group hysteria format. And I watched Hawaii when Fukushima happened and the tidal wave was coming into Hawaii. The day before it hit Hawaii, the shelves in all the stores in Kailua were rifled to the bone. I've got pictures. So, uh, you know, what's going to happen, I don't know. I know that you, all of you, need to have your water together right now. If we are getting coronal mass ejections, which do cause earthquakes, that's what caused Fukushima, probably, most likely. And I'm going to suggest that uh, the grid is going to collapse this year sometime for a period, probably not more than three days. But Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Sandy, how long was the grid down on the East Coast in certain sections? They don't even have the grid back in and, one section in New Jersey. And also, Doc, those two events that you talk about there, what perfect examples that we really do need to prepare for ourselves, because the government certainly ain't capable of taking care of you. We're in the private sector. The public sector part is being run by a bunch of uh, sociopaths. They're into transnational corporations that are bigger than our country. And so, the, you know, we are no longer a democracy. It doesn't work like that anymore. And most of the Americans are now just only basically getting it. And the banking thing, starting with Enron and the savings and loan crap that went down, I liked the way Iceland did it. They had a little website called hangthebankers.com. You'll notice all the Spanish bankers were let off, and they were in in, uh, in Portugal as well. I tell you something, uh, there's an ungodly amount of bank 